Hello, I'm Louisa Smith, the buying director for Book Passage Bookstore, and I'm thrilled to welcome you to our event, which we are co-hosting tonight with one of our favorite Southern California bookstores, Skylight Books. Tonight, we are celebrating Lisa Tadeo and her exciting new novel, Animal, which explores one woman's exhilarating transformation from prey to predator, a fiercely propulsive tale of female power, agency, friendship, and survival. Lisa Tadeo is the author of Three Women, She's contributed to the New York Times, New York, Esquire, Elle, Glamour, and many other publications. Her nonfiction has been included in the anthologies Best American Political Writing and Best American Sports Writing, and her short stories have won two push cards. I love what Entertainment Weekly had to say about Lisa and her new novel. They said, it's impossible to talk about Animal without talking about 2019's Three Women. That book, which follows the sexual and emotional lives of women, became the kind of cultural phenomenon that will forever follow Lisa Tadeo. Animal flows out of its predecessor, but where women deals with the perils of heteronormative gender politics, Animal deals in the way that the system pushes women to the brink. And where women is in conversation with Me Too, Animal is in conversation with the anger that follows reckoning. We couldn't agree more. And in conversation with Lisa tonight is someone who knows firsthand what it takes to write an irresistible thriller about relationships gone wrong, Gillian Flynn. Gillian is the author of the number one New York Times bestseller, Gone Girl, for which she wrote the Golden Globe nominated screenplay and the New York Times bestsellers, Dark Places and Sharp Objects. Before we begin, I want to thank everyone who is watching for joining us tonight. We know you have many choices of events and both virtual and in person these days. So we really thank you for spending your time with us for another special event. If at any time you have any questions, go ahead and enter them in the chat. We will be posting the link for Animal in the chat for anyone interested in learning more about the book or wishing to support Book Passage and Skylight by making a purchase. And with no further ado, I would love to turn things over to our two wonderful guests. Thank you to you both. Thank you so much. Thank you for having us, hosting us. Okay, Lisa. Hi. First of all, congratulations. The book comes out tomorrow, correct? Yes. Oh, uh, that's always the most thrilling feeling in the world of like, it's, it's out, it's in the world, it's a thing now. It's like, yeah. it's occupying space and reality instead of in my tortured writer's brain. Exactly. <laughs> but, but I'm, I'm just, I'm, so honored to be talking to you because I worship you. And um, and I just feel like we have so much, like a crazy weird amount of things in common. <laughs> yeah. um, and, you know, from being both, be, you know, having that journalist background. I mean, uh, Lisa, what Lisa was reading from uh, my, the big praise for your book from my alma mater, Entertainment Weekly, where I first cut my, my little journalist teeth. Um, <laughs> And you know, so I want to talk to you from everything from, you know, going from you know the difference between nonfiction and how that fuels your fiction because I think that's a very interesting and unusual thing. And of course, we have to just talk about women and sexuality and aggression and the, and so raising girls. So much to talk about. <laughs> but you know, I, I, you know, you and I were chatting before um, we we started um, about. I was just saying just how beautiful your prose is and I would love it if you want to just to <laughs> read like just a little bit so people can get an idea of how fucking great this book is. <laughs> <laughs> hey, um, thank you so much and I thank you. I am absolutely honored to be talking to you as I've already said, but I'm going to say it again and I'll say it again. <laughs> but thank you so much, Gillian. Um, I am really just beyond. Okay. This is from um, chapter one of, of Animal. I drove myself out of New York City where a man shot himself in front of me. He was a gluttonous man and when his blood came out, it looked like the blood of a pig. That's a cruel thing to think, I know. He did it in a restaurant where I was having dinner with another man, another married man. Do you see how this is going? But I wasn't always that way. The restaurant was called Piedina. On the exposed brick walls hung photographs of old Italian women rolling gnocchi across their giant flowered fingers. I was eating a bowl of tagliatelle bolognese. The sauce was thick and rust colored and there was a bright sprig of parsley at the top. 
I was facing the door when Vic came in. He was wearing a suit, which was usual. I'd only seen him once in casual clothes, a t-shirt and jeans, and it disturbed me very much. I'm sure he could tell. His arms were pale and soft, and I couldn't stop looking at them. He was never Victor. He was always Vic. He was my boss, and for a long time before anything happened, I looked up to him. He was very intelligent and clean and had a warm face. He ate and drank voraciously, but there was a dignity to his excess. He was generous, scooping cream spinach onto everyone else's plate before his own. He had a great vocabulary and a neat comb over and an extensive collection of fine hats. He had two children, a girl and a boy. The boy was mentally challenged and Vic somewhat kept this from me and the other people beneath him. He had only a picture of the daughter on his desk. Vic took me to hundreds of restaurants. We ate porterhouse at big clubby steakhouses with red banquettes and the waiters flirted with me. They either assumed he was my father or my older husband or they figured I was a mistress. We were somehow all of the above. His actual wife was at home in Red Bank. He said, I know you won't believe this because of what a slob I am, but my wife is actually very beautiful. In fact, she was not. Her hair was too short for her face and her skin was too white for the color she liked to wear. She looked like a good mother. She liked to buy little salt dishes and Turkish towels. And in the beginning of our friendship, I would walk around the city and if a bamboo salt dish caught my eye, I would snap a photo and text him, would your wife like? It can feel very safe to be friends with an older man who admires you. Anywhere you are, if something goes wrong, you can make a phone call and the man will come. The man who comes should be your father, but I didn't have one at that time and you will never. At a certain point, I began to rely on Vic for everything. We worked at an advertising firm. He was creative director. I had virtually no experience when I started, but I had this talent, he said. He promoted me from a regular assistant to a copywriter. At first, I enjoyed all the praise, and then I started to feel like I deserved everything I got that he had nothing to do with it. It took a few years for that to happen. In the interim, we started up a sexual relationship. I can tell you a lot about sex with a man to whom you are not attracted. It becomes all about your own performance, your own body and how it looks on the outside, the way it moves above this man who for you is only a spectator. While it was happening, I wasn't aware of how it was affecting me. I didn't notice until several years later when three showers a day were not enough. I mean, so there are many things I love about this book, and there are many things I love about your writing, um, both in the character and just the prose. And I need to start with the prose because the prose is like there are there are moments where I would read a paragraph like like that, or read a even a turn of phrase or a sentence. And I would say, depending on my mood, it would either hit me as like too close, too close. Oh my God. Um, I, I, or, or even possibly at the same time, I'd laugh out loud because it was so, <laughs> it was so true and dark and vicious. And it was like, she's saying it. All right. She's putting it out there. And like, I just so appreciated those moments where I was like, oh, she nailed me like she like I am in some ways and I think a lot of women in particular um and I advise men to read this book too I hate it when just because a book's written by a woman about a woman that's suddenly this a woman's book that women only women should read but there are there are moments that are very attuned to the exact female experience um and so and certainly um you know I think that oh god there's a great phrase where she says uh I'm a certain type of woman <laughs> when she's talking to when she's talking to one of the married men and, and um he says uh okay certain type of woman like <laughs> let's get out of here um but I think a lot of people will really it's going to chime with a lot of people I think it's also going to you know get this sort of like <laughs> how how dare we you know how dare we discuss this as if it's a reality you know it's it's okay if it's a little more distance and a little more, you know, more, even more gothic, and then we can handle it. Um, mm -hmm. But this feels so real. Um, but I think you and I are very similar. And like, we, we enjoy mm -hmm. tiptoeing right up to the edge of gothic. Like I like to see exactly how far I can get and then kind yeah. of pull back. And um, to me, that's the fun of those yeah. kind of characters. Totally. hundred percent. 
how did you, um, well, first of all, I, so I kind of had this rule, like I, I try not to talk too much about what happens after like page 50, because I don't ever want to <laughs> spoil anyone's story at all. But I'm also going to let you, you know, maybe you can explain just kind of the basics of your narrator. This is a first person narrator. So it's very intense. Her voice is just spot on perfect. You never lose it at any point. I never got a, you know, wrong, you know, I never chimed wrong. Um, it never felt like, I never had those moments where I was like, oh, she just likes that line, which is what <laughs> I sometimes do. <laughs> like I get attached to a line. It's like, ah, oh, fuck it. I'm just putting it in there. Um, but, but, <laughs> but, uh, but with you, it's, you know, I felt like I was in her head the whole time and, and I loved being there. I would not want to befriend this person. I don't think she would take good care of me, but, um, but I loved being there. <laughs> so, so talk about all that. Talk about, like, let's unload all that. Okay. Um, yeah. Um, well, you know, I, uh, so my, the main character, her name is Joan, as I've just read from the first um, two pages, she uh, is having dinner with a married man when another man walks in and shoots himself in the head in front of her. And that from there, sends her on this trip. Um, she decides, you know, not sometimes you just have to leave New York, you know, but um, on top of that, uh, she has this beyond having to leave New York just because she's been there a long time and it's been sort of like growing on her the wrong way. Um, this horrific event happens. So it, it kind of, um, it kind of makes New York a, a, a thing that she must run from. And she runs to Los Angeles uh, to find a woman named Alice who has a connection to her past, to Joan's past, that she believes will be the sort of key to, to learning why she kind of is where she is in her life. And it's, it's a traumatic event that happened when she was a child that, that we learn about um, over time and, and towards, towards the end. And she meets a, a very frightening and also hopefully intriguing cast of characters in, in Topanga Canyon in Los Angeles, which I always maintain it's like this. Have you, I'm sure you've been. <laughs> I was about to say, are there any other types of characters in Topanga? No, I don't know. I, I don't, you know, it, I don't know. I don't know. I, I've never met anything but the people with like the parrots on their shoulders. Like it, it's a, I mean, I lived up there. So I'm very, I'm quite, um, I am, um, I'm, I'm very familiar. But so that's, so that's the, it's, it's basically, it's a road trip to Los Angeles and then a lot of fucked up things. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> um, you know, it deals, you know, so frankly with a certain type of female sexual experience, certainly. And and that idea um of who is predator and who is prey mm -hmm. and at what point that happens, at what point, you know, I played with that a lot or worked, didn't feel like play, um, worked out a lot of that with, when I was writing Sharp Objects, that idea of, you know, who's doing what to whom and who has the power and, and does it matter in what way that power is, um, is mm -hmm. achieved. And it's, um, you know, I, I, she has an, an aunt, uh, the character has an aunt who she says trains her in the art of a, sexual battle or sexual <laughs> and, and the aunt warns her you know you have to use everything that you have and some people will call you names for it but that's only for their own <laughs> that only represents yeah. their own self-hatred <laughs> um yeah. you know and so i wonder how how much of three women um which is was so brilliant yeah. rolled into that I certainly am writing my next book as I'm finishing one book I'm, I'm right. I realize I'm playing with all the these ideas suddenly that don't fit into this book yeah. and then it goes into the next and to me it felt like that some of that might have have been the case but I'm curious yeah it, it, it was partly the case I mean I think that you know with three women obviously as you know having you know worked in, in working in both nonfiction and fiction with nonfiction you know, with real people, you are, um, you're dependent, obviously, on not just them telling you their stories, but on them also, on you having this responsibility to them, that even they don't really fully comprehend, because they're, they haven't 
probably been through it with regular people and non-celebrities. They haven't been through that sort of cycle of what it's like to talk to someone and then see your conversation in print. It's a shocking yeah. thing. Um, and, you know, so, so there were so many stories that they told me, not just those women and not, not just women, but men and, and so many people that I spoke to for the book that um, I did not make it in either because they didn't want me to put it in or I knew that those stories couldn't go in. Um, so there were a lot of stories that I had that I had left and a lot of really, you know, a lot of really dark, um, dark things that I, I felt would be, um, would be cathartic at some point, but I, I knew that three women wasn't the right place for it. Um, so, so a lot of that made its way into animal. And of course, at the same time, also animal for me is, is a really, is, is a book also about, um, about grief, you know, and, and Jones, um, it comes, a lot of it is, is personal in the sense that I lost both my parents um, fairly close to each other and not in the manner in which Joan loses hers. And for those of you who, who have read the book, you'll <laughs> understand that it's quite, um, you know, me saying that is, is, I have to say that otherwise it's like, <laughs> um, but I lost my parents and, and, um, and though it was, you know, at a car accident and, and illness, it was such a profound effect on me, um, the ways in which they, they passed away and how close I was to them prior. And, and so it's like, you know, and when what happens with Joan is for me, it's like the way that the feeling I had having lost my parents is kind of like having been bitten by a tiger. You know what I mean? Like you're lying there and people are like trying to give you band-aids and stuff to like, and it's like, no, 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 I've been bitten by a tiger. I'm like nothing yeah. left. Gushing. Yeah. I, <laughs> um, like not even here. Um, and so for me, Joan was a, was, was on top of the female rage that comes from what men and, and, and also other women do to each other. It's also the rage that comes from grief, the why me of it, why them, you know, the sort of walking down the street, seeing, you know, assholes walking around when your father is dead is like a certain kind of rage. And that permeates animal a lot as well. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I am, um, you know, we're at a, we're at such an interesting time period. And I, you know, I liked Lisa saying, talking about how, you know, three women was perfect right up the height of me too. Mm -hmm. And now this is really is kind of the aftermath. Cause I do think that we're at a place uh, where there's a, still a lot of anger. There's still not a lot of change. So it's kind of, we, some guys went to jail and now we're taking sensitivity classes and then, you know um but yeah. is the, you know is the culture actually truly changed yet I mean I, I certainly think we're on our way and I think um uh, you know you and I both have six-year-old daughters and I'm very excited for them to grow up in a a world that where they actually see a female vice president yeah. and 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 women in power and these sort of things in the way that I, I certainly I'm a little bit older I'm just a little bit older than you <laughs> um, <laughs> you know but didn't growing up and yeah. at all um mm -hmm. and you know you could be powerful if you were sexy right but it was very hard to be powerful if you did not have that that and I I'm still working through that I, I'm still kind of trying to figure out what that means to me and how not to bring it on to my daughter but you know you're you're so right about you know these moments of where you know uh, your character talks about looking around and even the big lighters sexualize even you yeah. know um everywhere yeah. you look it's sort of the how how else you know how do you react to that um and the, you know so the book does deal you know with a, a lot of that a lot of that anger and, and where it goes to mm -hmm. um do, did you find it cathartic while you're writing or did you get angry because I usually just get angrier <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah I mean I I think mostly cathartic I think like what you were saying about like tiptoeing up to the edge of of goth and sort of like you know dangling the pen there or the the computer or whatever it is I find it exciting to get to the sort of to, to the brink 
um, and say the things that the darkest parts of me and people that I know would might want to say. And I think when it comes to, you know, what you said is so 100% true, and I agree with you on, on every count, that I do think we are getting better um, but the culture is still has not changed from the inside out. And I think, you know, one of the things that we have is, you know, we have men um, now saying, you know, like, oh, it, it's they preface things like if, if I weren't woke, I would say you look fucking hot right now, you know, and it's like, so they have that little thing like, oh, I put that in there. This, you can see I'm cool. I'm cool. Right. But we're still cool. And that's what I love about, you know, about Amy from from Gone Girl is that the cool girl thing, it, it, having wanting to, needing to in a sense kind of really exist on that on that wavelength and at needing to be a Susan that's sexy and you know a little bit this and a little and all these perfect things cobbled together um, in order to also also be powerful is is really such a it's such a heady thing that we really I I don't know how like you said I don't know how not passing that on to, you know, I'm very conscious of like, try not to like wear makeup in front of my, or have her see me do, like, I'm always thinking about that. Cause my mom always put on a full face of makeup before and she didn't leave the house. So she just like put makeup on and like clean the, you know, polish the copper. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm just, I'm always thinking about that stuff, but yeah, I, I do. So I'm, I'm interested in the sexualization of women, obviously. Um, and I, and I guess in circuitously to answer your question, I, I, I do think it's cathartic to, to, to name it, to say like, look, I just, so I know, just so you know, I know what you're doing, you know? Yeah, 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 <laughs> yeah exactly. We're both woke. We're all woke here. <laughs> we're all woke. <laughs> <laughs> Is that the next step? We just all say, yeah. we're all woke and we all have daughters and moms, you know, <laughs> all okay. Um, but it, you know, it is that certainly strange because I don't mind anyone telling me I look pretty. I have, mm -hmm. Hey, that's yeah. great. Yeah. So it's, it, you know, it's always, it's, you just want to say like, it's so much more than that, man. Yeah, it's yeah, not, yeah. You know, and, yeah. but also yeah. like, I, I feel absolutely men are in a the good men are in a real, real tricky fun. time now. Cause they're yeah. just, you know, navigating. I was reading some lines to my husband cause I was loving it so much. <laughs> and he was like, can you please tell Lisa that she kind of made me feel really uncomfortable <laughs> <laughs> in a good way. <laughs> I mean, truly, he, was, he told me to pass that on. He was like, I, I feel like, um, he's like, I'm kind of questioning certain moves I had. And I was like, well, there are moves that worked on me. So I don't know. <laughs> I guess we're both screwed. Was your husband a little scared of you when you wrote Gone Girl? Okay. Yes, <laughs> he was scared of me. So I think Sharp Objects had just come out when, and we were dating. I was, we were in the meeting the parents stage. Um, oh, wow. And I remember his dad called him at work and was like, so, you know, I read Gillian's <laughs> book. Oh, no. and, and he goes, I just have one thing to say, I guess. Sleep with one eye open, son. <laughs> Sleep with one eye open. <laughs> <laughs> that's great that he didn't warn you away. he was just like just be careful so just be gotta be careful with her. <laughs> maybe a troubled woman <laughs> she may be a certain type of woman <laughs> certain type of woman <laughs> cheers to that <laughs> well, and I will admit I mean it's animal is so powerful and it just it's it's true and it's dark and it's, um it's really unnerving to the point that I was really I was kind of intimidated to meet you. I was, I was, I was like, you know, I was telling my, I was, I was telling my husband, I was like, you know, like, I don't know, like what, like, what if she doesn't like me? <laughs> or what if she, what if she's really mean? Or, and I've, I'm sure you come across it a lot. I come across that all the time where people will talk to me and they're like, oh, like, you know, like, this, you seem so, so nice. <laughs> it's like, it's fiction, people. It's fiction. Yes. <laughs> ultimately it's fiction <laughs> but I do find it I do love books like Animal because I do think it's really important to talk about um, you know darkness and grief and mishandling grief because um, when you go through grief you're going to mishandle it a little bit and um, as, or a lot and <laughs> um, and and the the darkness of that sexuality can take um because I feel like we're also right now in a space where 
the women lifting up women Mm -hmm. and empowering women has become commodified in a way that I don't, I immediately, um, I, you know, I don't, you know, self-help and self-help and self-help. And I, I understand. And sometimes I find, you know, comfort and, and, Mm. and usefulness in that. But I also want, I also want someone to be realistic about the other side. And I don't want to just, just be one or the other. And I feel like that, that still is a problem. I think it's a huge problem. And I think that, you know, it's, it's become, it's kind of like one of the, the, you know, the Me Too movement has been fantastic, but one of the, the detractor, you know, one of the few detractors is that I think that women have now sort of felt a lot of us have felt like we have to be very extremely on one side of things. And, you know, we are as a gender and as our individual people, so complex and so unique that we have different feelings about how to ascend and how to be, you know, how to, how to be the, the perfect versions of, or the, you know, the best versions of ourselves rather. And, but, but within this new construct, we kind of have, it's like, if we don't do it, this certain, very, very, you know, this certain path to it, if we like the wrong guy or the wrong woman or whatever, then we are kind of ostracized from the rest in a way that I think is really potentially damaging to the movement as a whole. Yes. Yes, absolutely agree. And, and so I just, i um, I still battle for that and I still, I still think that's important. And I said it way back in Sharp Objects when people were reviewing it and writing about it. And, you know, that's 12 years ago now, um, you know, where it's, it's um, you know, it's still that sort of, well, she writes dark female characters. Uh, it's like, I write characters. Yeah, exactly. They have darkness in them just the way an anti-hero does. There's an anti-hero in literature, almost everywhere you look, you read books about men and male characters, and I guarantee you they are not always consistently doing the right thing the way we're still encouraged to. And if you don't do that, then you're, you know, dark female writer lady like myself, which is, you know, I'm just, I'm just going with it at this point. I think you're doing all right. Whatever you want to call it. (laughs) Yes, you and I can hold hands and walk off into the darkness together and, and talk about horrible taboo subjects and be just fine. I'm totally happy to. That's yeah, exactly. And still raise good, powerful daughters. I, I believe it's, it's important to, to show that there's all sides of humans, both men and women. I always, I find that so interesting, the unlikable female narrator. You know, it's like such a, it's like you almost say it was like a hush unlikable it's like you know I just feel like so many of us would be unlikable if we said what we were actually thinking the way that you kind of want someone I believe uh, for me in a first person narrator to do I don't want them to kind of be demure and you know like and eat a strawberry all sensually like like everyone like there's a camera on you it's like do what you are gonna do when everyone's out of the house and you're like smashing things into your face over the sink I mean maybe that's just me but I have a hunch no. not. <laughs> so yeah, so I think I think the unlikable character. It's like, well, what in order to be likable, they have to act as though somebody's watching them at all times. I right, think. exactly. You know, and I, we were told when we were sharpening sharp sharp objects, and no one wanted it that particularly. And it was, you know, we heard a lot of like, um, women don't like to read books about female characters that they can't aspire to be. Yeah. And I was like, I don't think wow. that's true. I don't think I don't need a I don't <laughs> need a character to guide me on how to live. Like, yeah. I'm gonna fuck it up on my own. Thank you. Yeah. But, there's books <laughs> like, for that. You know, there's books for aspiring to. That's the right. thing. It's like there's books for there's all different kinds of books. Yeah, and all different kinds of narrators. And to not represent as many people as you see in real life in fiction seems to me a waste of fiction. Waste of fiction. Yeah. Well, you're so, you're incredibly versatile because you did magazines, you did short stories, 
you did a non um, you know amazing nonfiction book switched to fiction and my understanding is i read at least that your next is a, a memoir on grief is that yeah is that in the yeah so yeah. i mean you're really like i don't know how you tell me how you switch gears and do you have to switch gears or does does it come easily for you um it it does it, it does come, it comes fairly, I like to write both at the same, uh, concurrently. I like to be writing, um, Jen, when I'm writing nonfiction, I like to be reading nonfiction when I'm writing fiction and reading fiction when I'm writing nonfiction to kind of remind myself that you can break rules and also you must adhere to other rules. So I like, I like doing all the, the thing that's been, you know, genuinely the, the hardest new switch for me has been I've been doing it for a little bit now, but still, um, you know, I would love to talk to you <laughs> offline at some point, but the screenplays and, and scripts are definitely a whole, um, you know, a whole new beast. And, and it's, 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 it's so funny. different. It's, it's so, so different. different. And like, when I go back to, pro so switching between nonfiction and fiction is one thing, switching between screenplays and any kind of prose, I'm like, whoa, I can just keep writing on this line. I don't have to like delete any words. It doesn't matter if it goes like there's all that freedom. It's like, it's such a freedom. And, but it, I think it does at the same time train you to have an economy of words when you're done with the script, which I think is really super helpful. And that's where I think nonfiction writing comes in handy. Actually, yeah. it, having been a nonfiction writer informs the, my screenplays more yeah. than actually having been a fiction writer and forms my screenplays. Cool. That's, that's a good way to, I haven't really thought of it that way, but I should. I think it, you, yeah. it gives you that discipline. Yeah. You know, you have to have that structure. Yeah. You know, it, it's, it is not as free and you just, you know, you know that you're accepting those particular yeah. boundaries and working with it. Um, I think prose is more free for me at least. Sorry, you just froze for a second and then I heard you. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I was, uh, I gave you a piece of genius wisdom there and oh, we'll never God. come back. <laughs> just being brilliant, don't worry. Okay, okay. <laughs> well, everybody else heard it, I, I hope, and they'll be able to. <laughs> you, and, you and I will talk about it and not okay. uh, bore the good people watching about, okay. about that craft uh, okay. offline because okay. I would love to. I would love to. But, really um, good. Thank you. But, but yeah, I think, I think, um, yeah, for me, it's the, it's the nonfiction that helps with mm -hmm. this screen writing. I, I draw on that a lot more than I do with the prose, but I, I enjoy, as far as pure enjoyment of writing, it's definitely prose. It's yeah. definitely prose. And even when I was writing nonfiction, it was always as prosy as I could possibly get. Like I didn't, I didn't want to be a newspaper writer because I wasn't a good reporter. <laughs> and, that, and in fact, <laughs> I would hide my lack of report, unlike, your, unlike yourself. I would hide my reporting weaknesses um, by just writing the hell out of a story, it, yeah. you know, the prose wise. And I could kind of fake a little bit of the spots where I had, hadn't had the guts to really get in there and get the actual story, unlike yourself. <laughs> you no, know, no, but yeah. I feel the same. Totally has that skill. No, I, you know, I think the same thing though. I think that for me, being a, a reporter was not really, I do not like to be intrusive or invasive. And so what was really hard for, and I know that sounds uh, antithetical considering I just talked to women about their innermost private sex lives and desire stuff, but it, it really, it came from conversations and not me like doing any kind of yeah. digging I always felt that like digging was you know I mean it was one thing if you're writing about a politician and if you're doing that kind of reporting but if you're writing about you know quote unquote regular people then I think that um I always felt that I owed them a a you know just just the the most amount of leeway like what do you want to talk about and and if you what you want to talk about is boring I won't write about it but you know, I'm not going to sit here and try to get you to say something you don't want to say. You want to say, yeah, yes, ex exactly. And I was never the kind of reporter who was like, if someone called back and was like, yeah, I really wish, you know, I was in the, uh, you know, i will be like, no, we're on the record. Because <laughs> <Yeah. you know? laughs> uh, that was never my goal, you know. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> I got you on this little recorder here. <laughs> oh. And you also never know what people are going to, um, are going to get upset about, right? Like, yeah. I think one of the things that's so interesting. I, I interviewed, um, I interviewed uh, David Clough, who was Obama's yeah. campaign manager, right? 
And um, it was amazing. He was one of the smartest people I'd ever talked to. And I talked to Obama too, like when he was getting inaugurated, it was an amazing moment. I was like dripping wet, having come out of the shower. I was like waiting, I stupidly didn't know, I got the times wrong anyway. So I'm like, I'm dripping wet, naked, getting a phone call from Obama. And I'm just like, oh my God, this is so tricky. Um, <laughs> but after I talked, anyway, I wrote this story and, um, and, and David Puff had made a joke about Obama being bad at math, but he didn't really say bad at math. He just said something like, and I put it in the story. And I, there were other things I put in the story that I thought were going to be whatever. And <laughs> right. The whole thing, like, I guess Obama, either he read it or someone read it. And they're like, oh, I'm good at math. What are you talking about? Yeah. And I was just like, we oh, we're, we're in STEM. We need to promote <laughs> math for education. We can't say <laughs> the president can't do math. You know, that's what it was. <laughs> <laughs> But I was like, well, but he was being, he was making a joke. And it was like, I thought it was like, a, I thought it was disarming that he had said that about his friend. Anyway, whatever. So I, I, that stuff always really, you know, and always, that's what is so beautiful about fiction is you don't, you know, have to worry about that. Okay. Which is really amazing. Yes. And believe me, once you've been doing some screenplays for a while, you will enjoy the freedom. You'll be, I'm writing my novel, trying to finish my next novel right now. And every morning, I'm just like, for the first time in eight years, I don't have a studio that's I got eight emails from. And I wake up and I'm like, I'm just writing in my own little writer's lair. No one's going to bother me. No one has questions. And I don't have to worry about casting or budget or locations or or anyone giving me notes on anything. I'm just in my own world. And it just... I, I love the, I love the screenplay stuff, but this is feels, is feeling good after all that. <laughs> like I own this, I own this yes. place. Yeah, you know? yeah. There is something about book writing that I think I I've, I did not realize how incredibly freeing it was until I I got into this these other worlds where it's a little bit less free. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> 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 it's. <laughs> Yes, yeah, it's, it's always those little quotes or those little moments that would that were like, I I was worried about this thing over here. I thought that was going to be a big deal, and instead, it was this one little thing. But do you do that? How do you feel about being after being someone who interviewed people for a living about being on the other side? Because I'm really good at it. I'm I'm just sort of like go with God. Like I get it. <laughs> Like, I get it that there are certain yeah. things that you're going to capture about me that I'm like, that is so not right. Yeah. And yeah. that's okay. Cause you only had two hours with me yeah. and exactly. how, you know, how else, you know, I, I, I don't, I've never once like called an outlet, even when, even when I disagreed with something or felt something was kind of out of context or whatever. I'm like, cause you kind of get it sort of like, yeah. Oh yeah. I'm like, people, I get it. You think, think that the journalists are so mean spirited and like they're out to get me. And it's like, this, is, this is not the case. I was in journalism for 10 years and it yeah. really is not the case most of the time. Yeah, it's, it's you know, it's we're all just trying to kind of get by, right? We're <laughs> trying to get by. Um, and, and some of us get by and, and you know, in more, in more, you know, in, in nastier ways, I suppose. But for the most part, um, have, you, have you ever read Janet Malcolm's The Journalist and the Murder? Oh, you know I have. Oh, <laughs> I didn't know. But, oh my God. I mean, that's. Oh, you know I have. I love it. It's the best. It, it is, and I think for any, I would recommend. I recommend that anytime to you know younger or whatever any kind of writer who sort of you know journalist rather because it's such a it's it's so that that relationship just for you know those of you who have not read it it's the relationship between the writer and the subject and Janet Malcolm who's brilliant talks a lot about. Yes. You know, the um the fact that when you're writing it, when you're writing the piece, the subject has all the power. They say when, they say how much, they say, you know, all of it. And then the second it's over and you don't need them anymore, the writer has all the power. And it's like this, it, it's not a power that I've ever wanted to have. I didn't want to have the lack of power or the power. I just was like, all of it just feels like incredibly oh, it's just part, it's the part that I wish that I didn't have to deal with, which is why I think fiction is, you know, so great. Yeah, because if you're, if you're a good human, and I think most mm -hmm. journalists actually are, that the, they go into it usually because they're interested in humanity. Yeah, exactly. And they're actually, they actually really are trying to figure out 
your humanity and or yeah. if, it's, if it's a profile or whatever it is you know they're yeah. they're trying to figure that out and um yeah I, that's so funny I only mentioned I was, I was laughing because I literally just had a fatal vision Janet Malcolm book club with one of my friends really? <laughs> I made him read it he was like fine you've been talking about it for as a fellow entertainment weekly pal of mine so cool. and uh and and so we decided to like uh, re pair those two together, which is the for That's again for people who haven't read it is Fatal Vision was what it was a nonfiction book about a, a man on trial for murder and uh, and then Janet Malcolm was covering the fact that he didn't appreciate how he was covered basically <laughs> I'm, very, I'm doing the very short shrift on that but uh, anyone anyone interested in journalism should that those two should be required pairings I think. Yeah. I totally agree. My parents were reading Blind Faith. I read Blind Faith when I was like, somebody asked me the other day, why do you think you write such dark whatever? And I was like, they were like, what, what kind of books did you read as a kid? And for some reason, the two questions hadn't been asked like, like close enough to each other. And I'm just like, The Stand, Stephen King, lots of John Saul, V.C. Andrews, Flowers in the Attic. And I'm just going through, like, oh man, I'm like, oh shit. I was like nine years old reading Gothic horror. No wonder why I'm so fucked up. <laughs> you know? oh man i i feel like so, most of my fiction can be traced back to vc anders and the executioner's song <laughs> that's an amazing pairing that's fantastic that's one of the best pairings i feel like they'd really get along with each other if they i do too out. i think they'd have a hoot <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> I still re I, I'm rereading Executioner's song right now actually and it was interesting reading Animal a lot of there's a male I don't know if you're a fan of Mailer but it, it chimes with me the 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 conciseness of the the dialogue but it's perfect it captures it's not ornamental but it just perfectly captures these humans it feels so of that, uh, it, it, I guess it, it feels like someone who is, who is really, really good at nonfiction doing fiction to me. <laughs> well, I will, thank you. That's, I, I you know, I, I was a fan of, of Mailer. I, I still am, I, I say was being like, you know, but it's, it's weird, I, I think. And it's not about male authors so much as a certain type of male author that, yeah, you know, right. I think reading is, is a little bit, there's something um, a little, a little tiring sometimes. I think one of the James Salter is a is an exception to that rule, and um, and actually whenever I think of James Salter, I also think of one of my idols, and I think a mutual friend of ours, Adam Ross, who also is it falls out of that you know out of that that of all the oh yes. Uh, by the way, I'm sorry. I know we're gonna. Be, I just do not. I I really need to talk to you about your Sewanee review piece that you wrote. That I think I, I'm not sure if I, yes. I, 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 it is, it is one of the best pieces of writing that I've read, certainly about the pandemic. I think it's one of the best pieces. I, it's just like, it is one of the best pieces of writing I've read and, and the kicker is so beautiful and so haunting, <laughs> just like I can't get out of my head. So for whomever's out there, please, it, what was it called? The Corona Correspondences, right? Um, yes. and just Google Gillian Flynn Sawani review. I think it should come up, but it's, it's my favorite thing that I've read in, in the past, like two years. God, thank you. Cause I felt very, un I felt very unsturdy in my writing on that. I was, I wasn't quite, it took me a while to figure out what I was. So for, yeah, they had a bunch of different writers doing at different times of the coronavirus. And I was writing right near the beginning as the things were shutting down and, um, so thank you for that because that was the yeah. first piece of nonfiction I'd written in a really oh. long time. So I was kind of I felt like a little baby deer, sort of getting back on the. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> it was the opposite. It read like an absolute, just like on it. And I was talking to um, my other one of my other favorite writers, Stephanie Dandler, about it, and we were just like, we just were like, we we were like, <gasps> and the last line, like at the same time, like in sort of like in in shivers almost. So I just wanted to tell you, um, you. I, I enjoyed it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, I, th I think we are uh, taking some questions now. I will, I'm going to put on my CVS glasses <laughs> oh, my readers, that made me look like evil James Spader from the 80s. <laughs> um, <laughs> don't I? <laughs> it's the 
not I mean, you're, you're quite you look beautiful but I can see <laughs> the evil James I can see Thank it you. I'm okay with it I'm totally I'm fully, <laughs> I will, will fully own that <laughs> uh, let me see if I can figure this out um all right as I said I'm not very good at okay I got it. okay Lisa, what do you think the three women of three women would have to say about Joan? Oh, that's great. You know, it's so funny. That's such a great question. One of the three women, um, Lena, actually uh, texted me today and she said, I was looking at Animal and I was like, and it just looks a little, I don't know if I can deal. It looks a little dark. Um, it looks a little dark for me. Um, but I, you know, I don't know. I mean, I know that I've given Maggie the book and I've given, I've given the book to all three of them. Um, so I haven't, I haven't heard, I don't, I don't know what they're going to think. And I care, I, I'm very interested to know what they think because obviously, you know, I having written about them and having, I'm, I'm interested. I don't know what they're going to yeah. make. Of, I don't think they're going to love her is my, mm -hmm. is my, um, is my gut. Maybe, maybe Sloan will like her, mm -hmm. but I, I think that the other two might not. Are you eager to, to hear the reaction or do you, or, oh, yeah. Or, or, yeah, yeah. I mean, I'm, you know, there's a, there's a, there's a certain like, you know, like Maggie and her mom are reading it. I think I worry about like Maggie's mom. I think I worry about anyone's mom, like what they're going to think of me kind of a thing, you know, like, are you going to think differently of me? Um, and so I, I worry about stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And I don't know, it's maybe kind of silly, but I, I did, there's certain people that, you know, certain people that I look at as like motherly types that I'm kind of like a little bit haunted by the yeah. idea of them thinking that, you know, that these things have come from my brain. You know, I, I hear you on that. I hear you on that. Um, I find it's really important to not think about that at all while I'm writing the book at all right i can't think about that or it's, i get paralyzed and it's a really bad um and yeah once it's published i'm sort of like well oh, there it, it is it's out there you know what, what are you gonna do <laughs> um you know but certainly certainly um just starting to date someone while sharp objects came out but, but <laughs> became my that's husband that's <laughs> fixed that's fixed that's all that, that those worries <laughs> 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 you can't go back after that um okay um after writing an amazingly successful book, how did you both tackle the writing of your next one? Was there fear involved or uncertainty and how did you overcome it? Oh, excellent. Um, well, for me, I, I can say that I, I was um, I was writing Animal sort of at the, uh, while I was finishing up Three Women, um, when I was kind of waiting wow. for to to move and shift with some of the stories. So I was kind of in a, in a holding period and I actually, um, I had, I'd gone to school to get an MFA at BU and that's, and so Animal was somewhat, the beginning of Animal was my thesis statement for school. Um, so it, it wasn't, it, 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 it felt let it felt more like homework, to be honest, and a homework that I wanted to do. So I wasn't, I didn't have all the sort of, I, I wasn't like writing my second book so much as I was working out these other things I wanted to think about. So I didn't think about it as much in that way, like as a sophomore effort and, and what's going to happen. I, I didn't have any of, of that just because of the kind of um, the circumstances in which I was writing it. And what about you? Yeah, it's, not, it's nice to have that framework of like, I'm just yeah. got to gotta keep moving forward. Um, because that was fast. You must have written Animal in a year to have it or even sooner. Yeah. Yeah, probably like um, seven, six or seven months. The oh, first draft. But as my editor will you. remind me, as my editor will remind me, because I said something, he was like, do you remember when you had that that horrible ending in there? And I was like, oh, Jesus Christ. No, I actually didn't remember it. I actually did a really good job of putting that. So, I mean, it was, <laughs> it was not without its flaws. <laughs> but, um, but I did it. it it came it came fairly quickly it also was it was so um like I had so much like I was like with non fit with three women I was so constricted by waiting for for these women to talk to me at different times so with animal I was like oh I can just do whatever I want I can just write yeah. this stuff I can do it. <laughs> so I felt a lot free and what about you? you know I went from so you know it was interesting because I feel like I was the you know 12 years in the making overnight success, you know, because I, you know, I was, 
yeah. I, was, I, was, I was a working magazine writer while I wrote my first two books. So I had a full-time job then and I, I wrote the books and they did fine. Each one did it fine enough to get me another book contract. And I kind of just assumed that would be my life as I would have, I'd have the day job and I'd get to write books, you know, in the evening. And that was kind of the plan. And then, um, and then Gone Girl happened and I wrote the screenplay for Gone Girl. And then my dad's a film professor. So I got oh, wow. really, yeah. And I, you know, um, I think that that's cool. He gave me growing up where he took me to movies once a week. My mom taught reading. So she was always giving me books. So I, I grew up in a house that really loved stories and really valued stories, which was so lucky. Um, but yeah, then I got so, yeah, I was so excited to be like, in the movies um mm -hmm. you know and I loved writing the screenplay for Gone Girl and it was just so magical and so I then I was kind of in that world for a long time so I'm only just now kind of trying to get back in that headspace so I can yeah. get this uh write this next novel which like I said feels really good but um really excited I, I guess the the I guess the answer to mine is like I I didn't <laughs> I didn't write the next book very quickly <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Um, uh, here's, here's a good one for both writers, uh, considering how excellent and successful the day on Flynn are. Thank you, Marissa. Um, <laughs> how vital is the editor in their writing experience and shaping their novels? Um, I mean, incredibly vital. I, I have, um, I have a, a wonderful editor, uh, Jofi. I don't know if he's listening, but either way, he's wonderful. Um, he <laughs> is, uh, it, 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 it's funny because I think that, um, uh, I think the best editors and, and certainly the, and certainly Jofi and certainly most, most of the people I've worked with, I've really had great experiences across the board with magazine editors and, and book editors. And I have a, my editor in the UK at Bloomsbury, Alexis Kirschbaum is absolutely brilliant. I, I've, I've been, I think I've been incredibly lucky because I have seen what bad editors can be like. Um, but I think that good editors will give you one of the things that my editor who, when I used to write for Esquire used to say to me was like, you just go as crazy as you want. Like, just be weird, get as weird as you want. And I will, I will rein you in, but don't go in there worried about how you're, you're going to write and sound. Really and so funny. that, and that is so, I think that's so wonderful. And, and Jofi is very similar in this. There's a very hands-off sort of a thing. And then yes, there might be an ending at the end of a book where he's like, whoa, can you believe you wrote that? But he lets me write it, you know, like I, and I think the freedom to, to feel like you can be crazy and then someone else can be like, all right, well, let's talk about the marketplace now. And <laughs> let's talk about, <laughs> you know, not that actually not that that's ever been a part of it, but that, that to me, I think is, is so vital to have someone be very firmly in your corner and to let you know that, that they're going to be there to help you, but later. Yes. So true. I mean, I wrote, I wrote in magazines under Mark Harris, who's one of the great pop culture oh, yeah. writers right now and just re published a book about Mike Nichols. So I was lucky, that, I mean, that's who taught me at that's first, which was amazing. Yeah. Um, and and I've oddly enough, I've had a different editor for each of my books just because of the way editing is or because or of me, it could be, <laughs> it could be a, they left the, they left the penguin random house <laughs> i drove them out um but uh but i you know lindsay segnet was my who's brilliant was my editor on gone girl uh, all my editors have been amazing though uh, but uh, um you know i think the greatest thing that she did i don't like a lot of feedback i mean by the time i turn my book in i'm this not asking a lot of questions like i like this good i'm like this is really good like so <laughs> That's great. Okay, this is exactly what I want. So we're going <laughs> to negotiate a little bit now, but I, you know, I keep an open mind because I trust them so much. I mean, they're really, they're, you know, they've been really smart people whose opinion I do want. And so, you know, Lindsay would write sort of like, I'm getting bored. You're talking about cheese a lot here, <laughs> or like, or maybe rain in, or she, she'll catch me on reusing words too much. There are certain words I go back to. I'm slip, slippy and slithery and all the S words for some reason. And then but she was great. She was great because I wrote a really weird, I mean, Gone Girl was not, Gone Girl did not scream, this is going to be a hit remotely. I mean, no one, no one thought so. And I just remember she had total faith in me. She and Molly Stern, who was above her, who I 
just worship to. And I just remember saying like, so you wrote a whodunit where you find out who done it in the middle. It has two narrators, both of which are awful people <laughs> or at least do <laughs> awful things. And you have an ending that's not entirely like bringing like a big bow on it. And I was like, right. yep. <laughs> and they're like, okay, we just want to make sure you knew that. <laughs> um, here's a, here's a good one for you. Um, what did you, um, what did you read while writing animal? I like that. I like hearing what people read while they're actually writing. I read, um, I read a lot of, uh, I read a lot of short stories, um, when I'm writing one, because I love short stories and two, because they're like comestible little, you know, things that you can just kind of, um, uh, but one of, but I also, i I read, um, Natalia Ginsburg. Have you ever read any Natalia Ginsburg? I have not. So she wrote a book called that down, though. The Little Virtues, which is absolutely Oh, cool. okay. Yes. Um, I've not read her, but I know. Oh, yeah, yes. Fantastic. But the book that I read um, right before or right around the time that I was writing Animal was The Dry Heart, which is, um, which I, I think Animal, uh, I think there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of that that's in, in there, this sort of, it, it's, it's kind of a revenge story but it's so beautiful it's so um it's so small uh and tight and perfect and it's an absolutely beautiful book so that one was a very big um that and also samantha schweblin's fever dream i reread i absolutely love that book too for what it's worth it's, it's haunting well, I, I mean, I think we are near near the end right now. That was a good way to end talking about other amazing books. I have to throw out for you because yeah. you remind me of her, my one of my all time favorite authors, Joy Williams. <gasps> Stop it! She's my favorite. <laughs> I thought she might be. Oh or I thought God. she might be among. <laughs> oh my god! That is way. That's. I mean, to even be mentioned in the same. Um, in the same. Oh yes, book. you feel like you I, feel like I, by but, you yes. though. Like for you to say that is just, I don't even know what to do with that. I'm, I'm <laughs> made me happy beyond. Thank, wow. Thank you, you are the bastard love child of V.C. Andrews and Joy Williams. How about that? <laughs> oh <my God>. Thank <laughs> you. I will take that to my gothic grave. Take it from Evil James Spader. <laughs> I know what I'm talking about. <laughs> thank you so much. That's been amazing. Well, thank you both. This has been an incredible night for our viewers. Thank you for taking the time and for your openness and humor and everything you've brought to this. I imagine everybody's very excited to read uh, Animal Now, which goes on sale tomorrow. So <laughs> congratulations on your book birthday. Um, yes. You can pre-order it right now. The link is in the chat. And uh, or turn up at your favorite independent bookstore tomorrow and pick up a copy for yourself. You're going to want one for yourself and one to give to your girlfriend so you can all talk about it afterwards because it's so brilliant. Um, I want to say a huge thank you, of course, to Lisa and Gillian for being here and for um, just everything you've done tonight. It was really a special evening for everybody. And I also want to thank Skylight Books, who's our partner tonight. Uh, they're a wonderful store, and it's really an honor to be partnered with them. And a big thank you to Zach, who is behind the scenes making us look like we know what we're doing. So we really appreciate that. And of course, the biggest thank you to our audience members who are watching tonight. We really appreciate you taking the time to spend with us and hope that you will again soon. Um, please contact the stores if you have any questions about Lisa's books or Gillian's books because we have them both and we love them both. <laughs> and uh, have a wonderful evening. Thank, Thank you guys. You so much, Louisa. Thank, Thank you. you. Have Thank a you guys. Night.